Hey, welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Uh, oh. oh, that's gonna be the mark. Welcome to the best of any live Desert Rats 2010. Where we worked at the Black Point Lava Flow, which is about 45 minutes north of Flagstaff, Arizona. And we were out there for like 40 days and nights, and we interviewed tons of folks. And I followed the rover teams in the field as they sampled, walked, and traversed. You did that very well. And you didn't. Let's check out the video. Well, Black Point goes back to the Apollo days. Apollo crews were taken out in this area out here. So it's got a historical legacy to it. As you look behind us, you can't even tell you're really on lava flow here. It's really old, it's been weathered and eroded down. But the SP lava flow is about 70,000 years, okay? That is when our modern day humans left Africa and settled with Asia and Europe. I guess maybe I'm kind of romantic about this kind of stuff. But right now we're out here testing this rover, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's gonna help pave the way for the human migration out into the solar system. Sure. So it's interesting here at this point, we have a kind of snapshot of human evolution and migration and also geologic processes and evolution also. I've always enjoyed geology since uh, the time I was in college. I got into a geology class and I really liked being outdoors and I've always liked outer space and I was glad to learn that you could combine the two in this field that we call planetary geology or planetary science. That's kind of a backdoor way into the astronaut program because if we go to those planets you'd be likely candidates. Uh, sure, it's, uh, if we are going to send people somewhere, uh, the moon or Mars, asteroids, wherever it may be, if they're going to be on a solid surface, one of the obvious things they're going to do is study geologic processes, how those processes have shaped that surface. We now are coming into a time where we hopefully will be sending people somewhere using assets like we're testing here at Desert Rats. Uh, geology, field geology is coming back into play. So one of the features that it has is basically it has a basic um, map navigation. Also you have a clock feature which represents three different times, local time, uh, mission base time, and mm -hmm. it has a stopwatch which you can control. Mm -hmm. It also has a procedure cut list that displays your different procedures. This button here, ah. which is a blue button called note, yes. that allows the crew member to do a field note. That way when they finish their day, the science people pre-cover that data and instead of having to go through the whole pre-recorded video, they can just get the highlights from it. Now, I've got this here, okay, okay but this is much bigger and, and I think it's cool in a lot of ways, yep. but, but why why so big? What's the well, reasoning behind it? There that? are different things that you have to take into consideration. For example, if you're out in space, you're using a pressurized suit that has a pressurized um, globe on it. Oh, okay. So you need some spacing to be able to press the button. So if you take your iPhone, you probably won't be able to use it. Oh yeah, I've had trouble with my wimpy human hands, <laughs> uh, gloveless. It's hard not to be distracted right, right now because uh, just behind us, and you'll probably see it moving around back there, is Centaur 2, which is being tested over the last two weeks out here at Desert Rats. Really cool uh, piece of technology. And it's funny, uh, you had uh, robot uh, envy because uh, it would have been nice at Lunabotics to have yes. something like that. <laughs> oh, definitely. That's amazing. Now, with your internship, did you actually get to go on one of those traverses or did they just make you file back at the... <laughs> at the lab. I was doing anything but filing. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. I have experienced a traverse. Uh, actually, just yesterday, I had the opportunity to follow one of the rovers, a rover A, actually uh, into a large crater, uh, which is a really, really cool thing to do. Being on the chase team, uh, you get to follow the, the rovers around basically in trucks, and there's a big group of people that follows them just to see what they're doing. We got to follow these crew members and watch all their procedures as they went around and they collected rocks and then looked at the geology, and actually, it was a really strenuous hike, <laughs> I gotta say. I was so tired after following the traverses because they really they cover a lot of ground and they're busy all day long. My area is human factors in design and evaluation. So we look at the interior design trying to figure out how large it needs to be, what separation needs to exist between workstations, and then we do develop conceptual designs. We start out with foam core or wood mock-ups, then we progress to medium fidelity mock-ups like the rovers and the HDU that you see behind us. As you know from the previous coverage, the rovers are going around the countryside collecting geologic samples, but they're collecting many more samples than we can bring back to Earth. So in the PIM, they will do analysis, sample analysis, and that glove box is what enables them to do that. There's a camera network in the geology glove box, 
and we can transmit images as well as data that they've collected via their, their sensors. And that's transmitted over our communications network. Once we're actually in space, it'll be transmitted to teams of geologists all around the world. So you might have professors in Arizona, you might have professors in London, you might have professors in Moscow, all looking at those same samples, helping the astronauts to determine which ones are the best ones to bring to Earth. And there's a unique feature now that the HDU is being powered by the Challenger Center's power droid. And this is the first time that's happened officially uh, in the field. So tell us about that. Well, last year we were here and we did a few tests with NASA hardware, but this year about two thirds of the internal power is being provided by our power droid. The air conditioning is being provided by a separate link, but it's possible we could provide the entire you know, operating uh, electricity for the HDU and for anything attached to it. When we got to the pressurized excursion module, the PEM, we docked with that. We were able to go inside, which was nice because now we could stand up, stretch out really easily. In the rover, you can stand up without hitting your head, but there's not a whole lot of room for really stretching sure. out. So this gives sure. you a little more living space Especially to deal if with. you're spreading out your rock collection and, right. and sort of building little towers and whatnot. With right. them. You, you need <laughs> more room. Yeah. yeah, doing what keeps you sane for <laughs> yeah, a week yeah. or two weeks. <laughs> exactly. We did spend an awful lot of time in the desert, Franklin. Well, you were at base camp, I was in the field with the rover teams, and I brought you a segment called On The Go With Joe Every Day. Let's check it out. Now for the record, base camp was smack dab in the middle of the desert. You had porta potties. True that. <laughs> this is kind of our daily planning activities. Uh, have this book here that we follow through on with all our various traverses. But for day eight, if you notice, we're going to we're here at the PEM camp, the mm -hmm. pressurized excursion module, and what we're going to be doing is doing some simple traverses with both rover A and rover B. And if you look on the map here, we got two line colors here, blue and yellow. Blue is rover B, and yellow is rover A. And there's a few uh, stations along the traverse path as we uh, progress over the, the day's activities where we're going to conduct EVAs. Basically, each one would be about a 45-minute EVA. What are the objectives of the EVAs for uh, Rover B today? Well, they're looking at some interesting geological uh, uh, site locations that the, uh, the field team, the field geologists, have picked out uh, and try to do some sampling there, do some gigapan photography. Uh, specifically, I don't know myself exactly what we might find, but we did uh, understand that there's areas here that uh, we've uncovered that even the USGS and Flagstaff haven't seen before and are very uh, interested in, in our findings. So we are kind of exploring. Tell me the difference uh, between what you're doing this year and what you achieved last year on, uh, out here in Arizona. Uh, this year we have the uh, pressurized excursion module out here. Uh, and we're doing a lot more traverses, uh, simulating more or less a long distance traverse. We'll be driving an accumulative amount of distance on our planned drive, somewhere on the order of about 273 kilometers, which is a good long drive. You're familiar with the terrain out here, how yes. unfriendly it can get. And, you know, they've proven their robustness and we've been pretty happy with their performance capabilities. No flat tires? Uh, on the chase vehicles, <laughs> we've had a few of those. Uh, you know, they weren't destined to do some of the things that we're doing. But uh, you know, we've had about four or five uh, flat tires over that uh, over the past eight-day period. We're still on the go with Joe. End of day nine here at DRAS 2010. Joe, uh, how do we do today? Well, Franklin, uh, we did deviate quite a bit from our original plan. We were originally going to have four EVAs of a little shorter duration, maybe 45 minutes each. But there were some uh, significant uh, science team planning activities that uh, wanted to get some good gigapan shots as opposed uh, to maybe doing some EVAs at these uh, science stations. So they spent a good bit of time up there, and we've done a lot of driving and traversing, doing some uh, navigation waypoints. And uh, we did do it gigapan just about an hour ago at a very interesting panoramic area that overlooked all of this valley. Pretty dramatic, I thought. And now here, we ended up here at night camp uh, nine. So uh, everybody's getting ready to settle down for the evening and we'll start off again in the morning from this location. The strategic team will probably uh, switch up the plan for tomorrow based on what was originally planned, right? More than likely they'll surprise us and we'll have <laughs> perhaps a new traverse pa plan for the morning. Seems like the old plan is somewhat shifted throughout the rest of the, uh, uh, the second week due to the fact that we lost one day 
because of weather. Mm -hmm. So things have changed a little bit, and now the strategic uh, team is planning some other uh, alternative site locations during our various traverse days that are left. For the past couple of days, we've been on the go with Joe, but now I'm going to call it on the beat with Barbara. How are you doing, Barbara? Pretty good, thanks. What are we doing today? Today we are doing two really long EVAs. Um, this morning the crew for Rover A, that's EV3 and EV4, traversed down into Colton Crater here and then back up out of the crater. And then after lunch they'll be walking along the rim of the crater collecting rock samples. The, the, the walk down this morning was uh, pretty good. It was uh, a beast coming up, wasn't it? <laughs> it was pretty tough. What kind of samples are they looking to uh, get while they're on their uh, EVAs today? Well, they're going by the guidance of one of the crew, who's a geologist, and um, they're collecting samples that look interesting that came from inside the crater. And there's also a cone in the middle of the crater that they collected some samples from as well. And then on the way up out of the crater, I heard they found a piece of granite, so that's kind of interesting. Okay. Well, Barbara, we'll talk to you uh, later on in the day or after all the EVAs today to see what uh, uh, took place on the mountain, okay? Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Joe, did we have a successful day 11 in the field? Yeah, I think we had a very successful day. And in terms of the fact that we uh, stayed on our timeline, uh, we didn't circumvent or shortcut any of our uh, science way uh, stations you know, for our EVAs. So all in all, and I look at my watch, we got here early and uh, it may be a little shorter day for all of us, which does make a very successful event for everybody. What's next for the uh, two rovers, Rover Team A and B? Well, tomorrow again, we're going to be doing more traversing, heading back to our uh, base camp. We'll spend the day traversing across Highway 89, making night camp uh, for tomorrow night over at the uh, near the Spiderweb Ranch. And then the following day, we actually uh, go from there into base camp, spend a half a day traversing to base camp, and then the rest of that day, we spend doing some PEM operations. Okay, sounds good. On the Joe, on the Joe. <laughs> <laughs> on the go with Joe, finishing up uh, d -Rats Mission Day 11 in the field. Coming back with even more interviews from Franklin. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. I had a good time in the field. We should actually call this segment of the show Franklin A. An inside and outside look at all things Franklin. Yes, that's why they call me every man. All right, I'll send you a text and an email to confirm the name change. Blair, we're here at the first EVA location at the Black Point Lava Flow. Uh, the crew of Rover B has just exited the vehicle and they're about to go out, uh, survey this area, uh, go up to this outcrop or pile of rocks over here in this area and take some samples. After they get the samples, they'll bag them, tag them, return to the Rover, get in and move to the next location. Blair, if you look right now, there is a man and a woman uh, following uh, the crew of Rover B. They are part of the science field team uh, that is here to observe the crew in the environment to make sure that they are meeting objectives, uh, also taking details to see what the crew members see so that they can kind of cross-reference their information at the end of the day and when they kind of pull the data together to make sure that everything's on par with one another. Hey, I'm here with John who is a geologist and part of the field team that's out shadowing Rover B today. John, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. 
Well, we're shadowing the rover team here to try to evaluate the uh, quality of the, their observations in terms of the geology. What, what it is, is that we have this whole back room of scientists, and these are the eyes, in, essentially, of that science team back there. And so what we're trying to do is evaluate whether they're actually seeing uh, and, and describing the geology so that the, this back room science team can again get a full understanding of, of what they're seeing. Blair, you see there's uh, quite a few um, uh, people out here uh, with the crew members. We have a medical officer, a safety officer, we have the mission manager, uh, members from the science team. They all work together to make sure that things go as planned during the EVAs out in the field. Blair, the Rover B team is made up of uh, two crew members, one astronaut and one geologist. On your left, you'll see Stephanie Wilson. She's the astronaut, and on the right is geologist Kelsey Young. And this is Chuck, our medical officer, uh, attempting a two-foot leg split on the rocks, which uh, I don't believe is one I would do, but um, he has the balance of a cat. The, uh, the rocks here are very loose, and uh, I gotta make sure I don't hurt myself. Um, but um, I'm trying to get up a little closer so I can give you a little bit of insight into what the crew is doing on their EVA. The crew of uh, Rover B is at the base of. SP Mountain, and they're uh, getting some samples, communicating with the uh, tactical team back at base camp. EV-1 and 2, this is SICOM, just giving you a time check. You have a little bit over five minutes left. When they pick up the samples, they show them on the webcams on their backpacks, kind of describe the environment. You have to excuse me for sucking so much wind, but we're at 7,000 feet. And I'm out of shape. I'm on the uh, side of SP Mountain with Nate, one of the suit techs here uh, for DRADS 2010. Uh, Nate, what kind of observations are you making while the crew are uh, doing the EVA? Well, mostly uh, I don't really observe. It's, it's mainly I'm keeping track of my two subjects right there, making sure they have everything they need, make sure everything works well, make sure they're hydrated, comm is working. Uh, if comm isn't working, then uh, I'm like the first line of defense, getting in there, making sure the lights come on and the switches are in the right position. Talk to me if there is such a thing as a typical issue that might arise in the field. What is one that you, you, you see often? Well, this year I would have to say that uh, comm issues top the list. Uh, a lot of that is beyond my control. It's not really pack related, but uh, it's, it's probably that. Cool, but for, for the most part, pretty uneventful EVAs this year? I would, uh, I'd say so. I'd say not a, not a whole lot of drama, and that's good. I like it that way. That means you're doing your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it means I'm doing my job real well. I like how you gave me that Sedgway. Yeah, yeah, you know, hey, hey, look, I, th I think that'll make the tape cut today. <laughs> the rovers aren't the only things that are roaming across the uh, desert out here in Arizona. Triathlete is also out here for DRADS 2010. And today on day nine, the uh, crew is having a bit of a problem getting triathlete up and running. Let's talk to them and see what's going on. I'm here with Matt. Uh, you're one of the uh, technicians, a uh, research engineer. Uh, mechanical engineer for athlete team. Tell me what you're doing this year. This year we're, we're testing our robot. We're trying to get through a 40 kilometer drive. Uh, we're basically riding the thing hard and seeing, seeing where it breaks and trying to fix it. Have you encountered uh, any major problems this year? No showstoppers this year. There was there was one small part that had a stress concentration that we we had known about, but thought wasn't going to cause a problem. That did kind of sneak up and cause a problem, uh, but we we fixed it. We 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 bonded in an, an extra piece of material to strengthen that area. Okay, so uh, what are you doing out here on day nine? Day nine, we're trying to make it back to base camp. Uh, we rendezvoused with the PIM uh, yesterday, and we're heading back. We're trying to finish up a 40-kilometer drive. Okay, so what's the status of a triathlete uh, right now, though? 
right now we're trying to get the robot up and running. Uh, it looks like it's ready to go, so we'll be on our way pretty soon. The hardware is ready. The hardware is always ready. Um, but the software is? You know, software. You know, to err is human, but to really foul things up, you need a computer. <laughs> we got the truth in the field right here with the mechanical engineers of Triathlete. That's a great photo. We've got it. Thank you. Okay. Let me go ahead and do a field edit for us. You get to the map. Uh, this is sample 0438. I am sucking wind. Hiking out of this crater. That's a beast. I'm going to keep on pushing on. Later. Guys, we're here at the bottom of the Colton Crater here at the Black Point Lava Flow in Arizona. As you can see right behind me, this is actually the crater uh, in the bottom. We are in the bottom. Did I say we're in the bottom of the Colton Crater? Um, this is a pretty decent hike uh, to get down to the bottom. EVA 3 and 4 on Rover Team A is actually on the other side of this, uh, this little hill right here, which is the bottom. And uh, they're taking samples and shortly going to make their way back up out of the crater to the SEV. That little white spot right here at the top of the crater of this volcano is the uh, SEV. And we took this path right down into the crater. We're down in the bottom. Um, thank God for pants. I'm glad I put them on this morning. I didn't know that I was gonna be hiking down at the bottom of a volcano crater. Yeah, I'm here with Andrew. Andrew, the last time you were on NASA Edge, Blair uh, interviewed you while you were at Nemo. That's right. What are you doing out at DRATS 2010? Uh, well, I'm here as uh, part of the SEV team. We've uh, come up with a test protocol here where, as well as doing all our kind of engineering evals and making sure our our hardware works the way we want it to work. We're looking at different ways of operating a pair of vehicles, mm -hmm. and uh, that's required a lot of planning before we got out here, planning these uh, long traverses with the science team. And what the, the big picture is, we're looking at different ways of operating them in terms of how far apart they are, and then the amount of communication they have back with Earth. So uh, that's the study that we've designed, and uh, I'm trying to make sure we do all of that. How did you like hiking down here to the bottom of the Colton Crater? Uh, that was fine. I'm more worried about getting back up. Uh, <laughs> that, that's going to be the hard part, I think. That's actually some good exercise. Got my iPod in. So uh, we just finished shooting and on my way out. Good luck, Franklin. <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, it's funny. It is too funny. Who edits these packages? <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> you should just call Ryan out right on the... Where, where I mean, I mean, who edits these packages? <laughs> I give you a little cell phone video and under the bus I go. <laughs> I like that. Uh, you know, you yeah, absolutely.